Deckard is talking. So, hi. Hi. Hi, Deckard. Hi, Deckard. Hi, I like you. Um, and welcome to our panel on the works of Philip K. Dick. We originally tried to title it with um, it's an author's name in there, but you don't know Dick. That. You don't know Dick. You Dick mean the Dick Runner, I know? Blade Dick. Dick yeah. Report. We can Dick, Dick Recall. Wholesale. It just wasn't working out. So the Dick Bureau. A Dick, Dick Darkly. Yeah, it wasn't working. So I'm James. Um, a handful of you, or none of you actually, in the audience might better know me as Elsar. I'm from MyPower.com, and these are our companions. Child, I'm older than you, woman. Anyway, after that delightfully crass introduction, my name is Todd. I do a music video for you right now. It's a heck of a thing for her, bro, which is pretty much the entire fly by you myself. So take that. Uh, my name is Liz. I am a librarian in Connecticut. And um, at my library, I'm the go to person for pop culture. For both patrons uh, and for both patrons and staff. They all say, Liz, uh, I want to watch a movie. What do you think about Liz? I want to read a book. What do you think about That was the other title that got rejected The Golden Dick. The Golden Dick. Oh. There was an Austin Power. I own an object that I've named. No, I think that was from the TG thirteen panel. Is I did the button. I think um, that email was at the point where they told us get it right or we reject the panel forever. Speak, speaking of which, and see, I work in the library. I kind of order a lot of books for uh, the whole page of the panel. So I guess we can say thanks to you, James. I've getting a lot of it. And of course, Google's been getting a really mixed vibe off of me lately. Thank you so much. Actually, the entire panel is not going to discuss anything. It's just going to be We're just getting the last of the dick jokes out now. Okay, so. There we go. There he is. Um, what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> the part-time junkie, the legend. Philip K. Dick, in his life, wrote 44 novels and 121 short stories. He was, he was not a lazy man. Um, he is, in my mind, one of three people sort of vying for the title of Sci-Fi Tolkien, along with Heinlein and Frank Herbert. But runner up gets behind Sci-Fi is C.S. Lewis. Yeah, um, it's like, and then the Asimov fans come in here. Well. And then the Asimov fans come in here. Um, uh, any other thoughts on just the man himself? Actually, while well, we're talking about the Sci-Fi, one of the interesting things is the fact that the fact that man did write a couple of non-Sci-Fi pieces. A lot of the most yes. notable examples being a piece called Confessions of a Crap Art, which is basically a sort of slice of life in California in the 1950s. There's some kind of sci-fi because part of it is basically dealing with all the weird new agey cult groups that were going around the time. I will say, um, in this, we did watch most all the movies based on his work. We did exclude two movies. The first was a film based on Confessions of a Crap Artist because one's nearly impossible to find and two is not sci-fi. So Don't be wrong, I would actually really love to see that because I thought the book was pretty good. I'd be curious to see how that picture is. I still think you could actually probably find it with your feelings. Uh, the second was Radio Free Albion because I li I literally tried everything. I looked on torrents and I could not find a copy of the movie Radio Free Albion. What was that one? Oh. And so we move on All right. to our first movie. What about the Blade best? Run. This is probably the most famous, and here's the irony: for as well known as many of these movies are, most average film goers would still not know who the hell Philip K. Dick is. Just kind of a comic cosmic injustice. This is this is what I tell people a lot. You know, I have seen. In my life, a lot of movies. I, I've been doing the amateur film critic thing since 2010. Um, I've I went to film school, so we watched a lot of movies there. I've been studying film since I was 12 years old. So when I say this movie is my favorite movie of all time. That's not just me like blowing it. Like I love Blade Runner. Trust us, we hear about how great Blade Runner is once a week. It did come up a lot during the research for this panel. Not that it's a bad thing. It's relevant. Um, one thing I really like about this adaptation. I don't see this a lot in adaptations. Is uh, you see, like a lot of adaptations, when they do a movie form, like the Harry Potter movie, people are really bad about this. They will want to cut a subplot out of a movie version of the book, but that subplot will have a really famous scene or a popular character. So they leave chunks of it in there out of context. Um, Blade Runner is really, really excellent about not doing it. Like, there is a ton, like when I read the book, I read it a few years after I saw the movie. Same here. There is a ton of stuff that got sliced out. There is um, this whole religion of mercerism. Yep. There is uh, the mood organ, there's Buster Smiley, there's, there's his wife, there's the fake police agency, yep. everything else. There's the thing about the little toad. There's, there's a little rash who it turns out is another ground tender who actually finds out he's a replicant. Yep. There are Android as they call them. There, there's, a, there's a part of the movie where this ostrich passes by in the background. That ostrich is a bigger deal than what they might expect. It is. Actually, uh, I will say one of the interesting comparison points is you brought up mercerism. One of the big themes of the novel that 
I do kind of love the fact that Mozart inverts this theme is there's a whole big push for empathy. Like Mozart is basically an entire cult-like religion founded on the idea of shared animals of empathy. Animals are an endangered species, so they're basically protected on the idea of empathy. You you have an animal, it means you feel something. Well, and it's also in many cases if you have there there are two types of animals in the story. There are real animals, and then there are android animals. And like owning she, owning a live animal is not just your empathy; it's a sex. And also the entire yeah. contest, well, like, really quick one, it's basically you're supposed to test energy. The question yeah. is basically to test how you how you feel. And did you go into your actual scene? Your verbal, yeah. verbal yeah. answers aren't what matters. It's your immediate. It's your like reflex response, right? And it, so basically, it's like there's a big push for it to be. Meanwhile, in the film, I, again, it, it still works great. It's only because there's the whole thing in the back that instead of being an over empathic culture, their culture is kind of. Everyone's becoming overly cynical and very detached. The Earth is going to shoot as a result of it. Well, here's the, here, and this is how I view adaptations. Uh, some people will view a good adaptation simply as taking um, the words on the page and putting them up on the screen. I don't think that's always the case. There are very few that were basically page to screen. I think the best example is Coe Brothers No Punch and Rolls Men. It is essentially, I think, one of the most faithful, if not the most faithful. Well, we'll see the simply faithful one later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that I've ever seen. However, I also think you can take liberties with a book and adapt it as long as you keep it in, in, if you is that. As long as you keep with the initial spirit, the initial uh, idea of the work. Uh, the initial idea of the work. And again, there are some of these works that, you know, while they are technically not good at, you know, great adaptations, they do keep it, or they aren't faithful adaptations, they are still good because they keep with the idea or they expand upon it. And I think Blade Runner is good because, again, there's a lot of stuff that's cut out, but it does keep with the initial story. It, it keeps the core. The story. Exactly. That's the, if nothing else, at the very core, Decker is still very much the same kind of character. He's this sort of burnt out guy who he's been through a lot. If anything, the film is... It's a distillation. It's a distillation, and it's more, it is more focused on a singular aspect of the story rather than the whole world as a whole. But regardless of that, Even I do... I will actually say, and some people do want to have my head for this. I actually, um, in terms of telling the entire story, um, telling the entire story, I actually think Blade Runner surpasses Androids. At least for me, I liked the atmosphere I got out of the film more. I loved the visual aspect. I am, I love film as well. I'm a more visual person, and I did feel sometimes while reading Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, I didn't get, I got an idea of what the world was like, but I couldn't really visualize it. Entirely, and there were certain points that kind of lost me. But whereas Blade Runner, it was very tight, it was very compact, and it told the story very well. The world of Blade Runner is actually like this. Is, we'll see this in a recurring theme. The moral of Blade Runner is actually very different from the moral of Duran Yes, that's yeah. true. We'll see that as a recurring theme in some yeah. of the better movies on this list. But the world of Blade Runner is actually substantially different from the world of Duran Jones who like yes. Like Blade Runner sort of codified the cyberpunk people's reign yeah. equation. Yeah. Whereas, Rain and dark and lights. It's like, whereas, um, in Duran Duran, you were like a cheap, it's very deserty, it's very dry. They call it World War II, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the world that I got a vision of, of Blade Runner, you know, a little vision I got out of it, and again, maybe it was, this is all on me, I mean, reading is subjective, but I just imagined sort of like a New York City event. So and actually, like, that's the other interesting thing as far as comparing the two is. In Blade Runner, you basically see the entire city just sprawling. There are people everywhere. It's packed to the brim. Like the fact that J. F. Sebastian lives in an apartment by himself is almost a rarity. Yeah. Then you find out in Jared Jim Local Sheep, his his equivalent, his proxy J. R. is York. His living alone in an apartment is actually sadly common in that so many people have already left the planet. Uh, um, people, when I, when I talk about this, people especially want to discuss the theatrical cut of it. And you know, my opinion on the theatrical cut is there is no theatrical cut. So what is it? What version should we all purchase? I, I, I own the, 2000, the, final the 2007 final cut. Everyone owns that. Uh, I have the big job done. I have the big box set with all five. Uh, yes. I, I. Is it, this is a weird thing with this guy. It seems that his his director is working. I'm not sure which two. I. I I can talk loud enough anyway. Here's the thing I, I, I find interesting about, about Ridley Scott. Like, like it seems that his, that his the theatrical cuts of his movies, a lot of his movies seem to be a lot worse than than the director's cut. Like, 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 the, like the director's cut of Legend. Ever, ever seen Legend? No, I it's been years. Been I've seen the I've seen the theatrical. I, my big example is the director's cut is really good. Oh man, King of the Heaven is 
Kingdom of Heaven. The, yeah. the, the director's cut of Kingdom of Heaven is an entirely yeah. different. Really, we could do an entire panel on Hollywood yeah. producers um, meddling in the well, We are talking about Philip K. Dick, and we've okay. only got a limited amount of time. Okay, so I have so one more thing I want to address, which is how many people here read um, Ender's Game? Um, I noticed when I was reading um, Grand, I of course read Andrew's Game when I was a kid because you know, grew up in the 90s. Yeah. Um, I noticed there's there's these sequences in Grand Birds of Molecular Sheep where he goes, where they go into these, uh, this vision of their religious leader, you know, crawling up a hill. I noticed a very distinct influence from that on the Giants game sequences in Andrew's Game. If anyone remembers those sequences. I think they probably got cut from the movie, I never saw it. Now, I will say, say one final thought as far as comparing and contrasting Blade Runner and Blade Runner. I don't so much see it as, honestly, for me, I think part of the reason I can reconcile them, and part of why I have an issue comparing to is there are variations on a theme where it's, they it's each true. take the base concept and just explore it in a whole different direction. It was, it was the I just like the way Blade Runner did it more, but again, that's I fair, that is subjective. It was the only one of these films produced while well, um, I feel like it was still alive. Yeah, he read yeah. the script and he apparently loved it to pieces. He yeah. thought it was a complimentary he, story. Wasn't like he died just before or just after the movie came out? Right before it came out. Alright, right. so now we are going to have to move on to everyone's favorite movie. Oh god! Oh. The screenshot. Okay, um, this one. I will say about Total Recall, it is a good movie. It's it so is, much fun. It's got good action, it's got mostly good acting, excuse me. Um, it's, it's got, got a good pretty effects. crazy cheer with the top. It's got a solid up. script for a stupid sci fi movie. It's got a good concept. It moves a good clip. It is a terrible adaptation. Oh, it is. Awful. Here's um, the thing nine times out of ten, when they adapt the Philip K. Dick short story, it's they'll take the very loose theme, very loose, like, if this really be to take out just the spinal cord and build a whole new body around it. So that's because, Mostly. and you'll see this a lot, Philip K. Dick, most of the stuff was really freaking. Well, it it's not just the weirdness, it's also the fact that short stories, the other kind of thing you, can, you don't really need to expand on, you can tell things based on 20 like to 30 minutes. Yeah, minutes yeah, yeah we'll, we'll talk about more like more ones yeah. on this one later. This one ended on kind of like, doesn't he find out yeah, that that's what, these aliens invaded Earth when he was a kid and he's the one who's changed their minds? And just yeah, like, <laughs> let's put it this way. The only real difference, the only real comparison between Total Recall and We Can Remember Before You Won't Sale is you have a main character in the original story, is actually called Douglas Quayle instead of Douglas Quay. I guess they figured Quayle sounded kind of stupid as last name. <laughs> to be fair, Philip K. Dick stories always have kind of weird names. Douglas Quayle keeps wanting to go to Mars. So he goes to the recall. Get your ass to Mars. Get your ass to Mars. It's, it's, it's like he finally decides one day, even though the rest of telling him to get over this, he's going to go to the recall company. He promised being Bell set up his home and he's obviously a secret agent on Mars. The problem is afterwards he finds out he remembers going to the recall company. So he goes there for a refund. So they find out he actually was a secret agent. They actually triggered his old memories. And then they try to cover it up. They actually find out a whole other set of suppressed memories they have triggered. Yeah. The thing that bothered me, and I really don't want to get into Total Remake that much, was is I remember when the Total... We'll get into Total Remake at the end. Okay, I just, can I just say one thing? I remember when they came and said, oh no, this isn't going to be a remake of the Arnold movie. This is going to be a new take on it. It's going to be more faithful to the story. And they yep. always... Say that, say, and then it comes out, and it's just a remake of the uh, Arnold movie. Say, I'm like, um, we'll talk about the remake at the end. Um, it is an even worse adaptation than this one. <laughs> it's um, such it's being a beat for beat retread of the original movie. I would not have did. I would commend any producer with a cojones to actually end this the way the original story actually ends, because the mic's shut. Yeah, they basically describe how they, at first they try and cover up the spiders with a whole other fictitious memory that. As a child, he met this alien race and basically persuaded them to spare the Earth from an invasion as an act of love. And they were going to the reward with the condition that you not tell anyone. And against all impossible odds, he actually had a set of memories like that because that actually happened. So there's this one of, well, now what do we do? Yeah. Um, I was, one thing I noticed, we'll talk about Golden Man later, I think the mutants in this, which aren't at all in the short story, um, we can remember it for you. I think they were very much inspired by the mutants that we see off screen in The Golden Man, which is another one we we'll cover later. Golden Man, really. Oh, um, I didn't watch that one. I'm gonna see you're lucky. That now. Um, so I think we're ready to move on to <laughs> Screamers. <laughs> that's, that's Robocop, by the way, on screen there. Yep. Fun, inappropriately fond of like a teddy bear. <laughs> this adaptation, I feel oh, really good. Well, well, I honestly think oh. Second Variety was the, my favorite short story that I read for this panel. Um, it's, um, as you can see, this is what I mean when I say Philip Dick is very influential, when you just get as many adaptations from other people. But it's about robots that start building their own robots and start becoming more humans and will wipe out humanity. 
So I see influence from it on Battlestar Galactica, especially Terminator. on Terminator. The, the don't let her, yeah, don't let her on the security the, the come kill me. Um, I even see a little bit on the Animatrix. Um, Oh no, you see a lot of Especially um, with the first second, one. Second Renaissance? That one, yeah. Basically, it's. And I can understand why they changed the saying because the original story is basically it's a future where Russia and the rest of the world came to blows. This is written back before the whole Cold War finally ended. Russia ruins everything. And it? basically, <laughs> Russia, Russia basically sucker punches the rest of the world. So, in order to keep up, the UN, they build what they refer to as claws, which are essentially automated killing machines. Eventually, the machines start evolving and becoming better and they, better. They have a plan. Yeah. Um, they the, plan? the weird thing about this story is that for like the first half of it, it is actually a pretty faithful adaptation of the book. And then it goes really stupid. It, it, it basically means that love saves the day. That's a really hard thing to pull off. The original ending is very much a Twilight Zone ending where it's the guy winds up accidentally giving one of the claws to me to reach the humans on another planet. And as he's dying, he's at that moment of, oh dear god, what have I done? It turns out that the human he gave it to was actually a robot. Um, this one's not really, there's not much to talk about. I mean, kind of like squittered in and out of theaters. The CGI is really hysterically bad at points. Oh, it is. It's, who cares? It remember, it remembers the uh, Langoliers miniseries. It's that bad. Oh, yeah. It's that bad. And though it does feature Peter Willard firing a flamethrower with tendrils. That, it, it, I always see You know, that. for as terrible as the CG is, I have to admit, their designs for the early phases of the claws are actually pretty cool. Like that murderous robot chameleon thing. Yeah, it's it's not as bad as some of the other movies when it gets on this. It's not very good. If you're into bad horror movies, it's, it's, okay. it's like it's a weak star, actually a pretty good act two, and then in act three you can hear the car screech off the road and smash the telephone pole. It, it's a shame that a lot of these, and when this is going to be a recurrent thing, but like this would have made it this could be made in the moving picture medium, but better a outer limits episode, a twilight zone episode. Maybe a short film. Stre some, some short stories can be stretched into a full-length feature. Others cannot. <laughs> there's not, a lot of things. There's not really enough meat on their bones yeah. to make a full movie. Speaking of, oh us. boy. Fun, funny story about this, with related to what she was just saying. This was supposed to be a short movie. Oh, it was. It was made into an episode of a BBC series called Out of This World in the 60s. Well... But they, but because the BBC in the 60s decided, hey, we've finished shooting this episode, we don't need it anymore, they liked the tape and we but can't see it anymore. That's why we can't see some early uh, It started as a project that bridged to a three-part sci-fi anthology film. It was going to... And it gave birth to this, it gave birth to Mimic, and the third part turned into a 30-minute short feature in Kenneth Branagh that he's only ever for audiences on two occasions. <laughs> Which means it's got to be good. Also, and speaking of the other film we went, Mimic, another, uh, one of the, few, the one movie, Kevin Will's Horror, is not that proud of. What does that say about this? Well, it's more he's frustrated about what the studio has put him through, but it's a matter of the, the short story, the short story, like reading it, I remember just putting it down thinking, man, this would make a killer Twilight Zone. It's, oh, it's all like 10 pages long. Though I will say the whole, again, we bring up the whole, he has a thing about humanoid robots, Mr. Dick. Yeah. Um, th this brings it up again with one who's like programmed to think he is the person he's imitating. Again, I wonder if Battlestar Galactica was aware yeah, of this at all. I wonder if it wonder. The really frustrating part is, there are parts that you can still, were still made for when it was a short. So apparently as the story when the producer started seeing the dailies, they were like, we really like this, can you build on this? So, the beginning and the end, actually, they're a pretty good match of the story. The problem is that it'll be to pat it out this hour in the middle of just needless fugitive on the run in dystopian future. It's got this really weird habit of, like, introducing these characters who don't get any screen time and then trying to give them, like, struggles and make us sympathize with It's a very yeah. strange little movie. It's actually funny, you look through the credits and you realize most of these characters don't actually have names. It's just... Tony Shalhoub is in it. It's like Elizabeth Payne is just credited as... What was it? Midwife. Midwife. Well, if Elizabeth Payne deserves better, she's in Jacob's Ladder. It's also the only one of these movies that's on Netflix. Um, it's got a good first act, in my opinion. It's got a weak second act. It's got no. It's got a. I actually kind of balls in. It's like I do like the fact they actually keep the original story's ending. I just wish they had not taken they, ninety minutes to get there. Stop, you know, the robot finds out that he's a robot and he blows up, and there goes the city. The way the book ends it is actually is pretty chunky because he's sort of like. But if that means I'm not old, and then next guy's the last sentence is basically the explosion could be seen from Alpha Centauri. It's just such a massive, Dick reaches out through the pages and punches you in the stomach. Ha, ha, right, right, again, you have to, unfortunately, I did not get to watch this, but I'm like, well, if, you know, if they did that, if they kept the original ending, well, they you gotta did. give them, well, that's what I'm saying, you gotta give them some credit, like, I don't know, maybe a, you know, C-minus forever? 
a D minus or whatever. It's not, I just wish they kept the shorter cut they wanted. Yeah. There, are, there are chunks of this that does that actually work. There are also chunks of it that are incredibly strange. Like you talked about the whole surgery scene. Oh. It was like really weirdly edited for reasons like, we can never most figure of, out. Most of the movie has kind of very bog standard editing. Then there's a scene where, because Gary sees the characters on the run, and because it's a cyberpunk dystopian future, and by the way, as a fun fact, the opening scene of this movie blatantly crib scenes from Starship Troopers. There's an actual like, physical scenes from Starship Troopers. I, I, James actually attested this, I was talking as I was watching it, he was like, so is it wait a minute, like is this Starship Troopers? I mean, it is! Is it kind of like how that movie Space Mutiny crib food from the old Battlestar Galactica? Exactly. Oh my god, I need like, to like, watch this now. <laughs> Let's put it this way. They do an opening news scroll about how the entire Alpha Centauri war has turned Earth into Soviet. Well, yeah. And you're seeing all these soldiers, it's like you're seeing all these soldiers close up. They cut the footage off just before it does the I'm doing my part in this today. Oh, yeah. they do, I will also say that the short story and the movie, for that matter, they Philip K. Dick has this thing where he will have like robots or whatever enemies sent, but you will never actually see the enemy. You never see the Russians in us uh, in Second Variety, you never see the aliens in Imposter. You, they, he, I don't think he, I think he really did believe nothing is scarier. So but actually, since you asked me about this, to, uh, to follow up on the thing with the editing, there is one scene where he's on the run. He's got a trap and thing of spine because again, it's Tokyo future. So no, they have to go to this, they have to go to this basically black market surgeon to remove it. And the entire scene where most of this is just here pretty box hair editing. This just keeps intercutting to before and after the surgery. These quick cuts where it's like, what is the point of this? They could have just filmed the they could just show the conversation before and then just done like a quick cut to after putting the cutout thing on the table. Unfortunately with um with these movies with this and screamers, they're bad, but they're not really interesting or weirdly bad. They're just kinda of boring. So we don't really have a whole it's, lot to say about They them. had promise, but they just don't live up to it. So we're gonna move on to a movie I actually yes. kinda of like. I, yes. I don't care what anyone says. I dig the hell out of this movie. It's got some really, really great editing from Michael yeah. Connors, one of the best in the business of this. It's great direction, great action. It's, it's got, one of the few later Spielberg movies not bogged down by Zaddy issues. It's, got, it's I, kind of there, but not as badly. I do like Tom Cruise in this. You know, Tom Cruise yeah. gets a bad rap. Oh, he's a good action star. This is actually probably better later roles Max von Sydow has had. And Samantha, and Samantha Morton, who, uh, is she, I think she's most well known here for In America and in The Messenger. She's great to see. She plays one of the three gods. She's fabulous. Actually, if I can go off on the precogs for a moment, reading the story, the, the precogs are supposed to be these incredibly malformed, like tiny bodies, huge heads. They're also supposed to be mentally retarded, so they kind of they have wonky faces. I do kind of wish we could have gotten that, just because I would have loved. I would have loved to have seen what like a Rick Baker. Or a practical effects person could have come up through. Really want to see Tom Cruise letting one of those things through. That you know what? Really I, mean, would, I, I, I would. I would. I would. I swore I would like to see what someone would do, but unfortunately, in this day and age, it would probably just have been CGI, like old guy Pearson for me. Well, it's, it's oh. <laughs> see, this is another which actually kind of works because it's not a base adaptation, but it's a variation on a theme. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's um. I said earlier we said this about Blade Runner. Um, I, a lot of the better adaptations actually do come down on the opposite moral side oh, yeah. of the original movie. The, the original short story, um, the main character is the person who kills to keep yeah. um, three times going. And it's actually a pretty, su it's a subversive story. He essentially, they, the main reason the person who wants pre-crime to end, the person who wants pre-crime to end is a part of the military. And he goes, well, if pre-crime ends, then there will be crime and then the military can make money again. You know, I can kind of see why Hollywood, it's like who... Free crime is essentially the lesser evil in the original story. Like, I can see why story. Hollywood, who continuously does get support from the armed services, might not want to be Well, that, that, all, that and also, remember, this kind of came out during that period of post-9-11, yeah. sort of, what's our government really doing here in a way, where endorsements to, like, free crime would be seen as a really bad idea. Exactly, and it, do, and it does work. I actually, this is one of the ones where it's not faithful, but, you know, with the idea that it takes, and again, it works within the context of society. It really does work very well, and it's a very thrilling movie. I mean, the, uh, the I see alone. Uh, I do kind of wish that, actually, well, it wouldn't work for saying, I would have liked to see a film that actually do the original ending, because the way it's done in the story is actually kind of ballsy. It's pretty chilly, the last line, it could happen to you, too. The basic idea of the short story is that you find, is that there is a paradox in which the only way he's going to commit this murder is if he knows he's been predicted to not commit this murder. Yeah. Yes. So, but that could only happen to the person who's the head of free crime. And basically the way they're pointing this out is the entire idea that minority report, initially it's believed that just one zero to two, instead it's actually one of them builds on the report, the other builds on the report, the other, so the, basically it's, 
First one sees he's going to kill. Second one sees he's going to kill. He knows he's going to kill, he's not going to do it. The third one then sees the random cases and says, he's going to kill because he knows he yeah. has to. I mean, the movie kind of keeps with that a little bit, and then it just keeps going. But yeah. it keeps going in a good way. It does, it does, I will say this, it does have a kind of a shitty ending. Um, people have tried to claim that it's all in the lead character's head. I don't totally agree with that, because there is a scene earlier in the movie that's all in his head that has an altered filter when he's um, flashback and he's oh, yeah. kidnapped. The ending doesn't have that. I, I see why they want to do that because it's a dumb ending. Whatever. I, I will say this. Bad last one is. Even with the quick fix happy ending. Even with the quick fix happy ending, I do like how they kind of mess with the expectations at that one point. When Carl Paul and Farrell goes in, he's about to throw the on fire. He's like, you notice anything? You don't turn your police cars. No quick pick of the spiders. That's because the pre crime system is working. Then he just shoots him right at the table. Yeah. It's kind of like poor Carl. Because at first it's going to be like he's, he's going to clear, he's going to clear your top scores his name and then nope. It's um, it's a good. I, I, again, people have complained about it. I will go to bat for this movie. It's a good action movie. Right. Um, it's definitely one of the better ones on this list, and it was a huge success on like most of these movies. So it's like, which, again, in case and I'm sure everyone knows this, Blade Runner it came out bomb hard. Oh yeah, the summer of '82. It was like '82 was a cool year for sci-fi because I think it was an E.T. guys. Stop alien visitation the thing better than ET. That's actually the irony. Is, you look at it nowadays, well, ET is still kind of liked. Labor and the thing are generally regarded as the superior movies. The thing is awesome. But, uh, you know, any movie that has a big success is probably going to inspire them to take this. And remember how I talked about how movies that are bad but aren't interestingly bad? This one's interestingly bad. It is. Oh, so, God. Um, can I just. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, this movie, fun story. Um, I saw this on a plane. I usually don't sleep on planes because I don't want to be accepted. Um, but uh, I'll tell you this: when this movie came on, ten minutes in, this that's movie, all I know. This movie came out in 2003 and starred Ben Affleck. Oh, Does anyone in the audience want to tell me what else came out in 2003 and starred Ben Affleck? Geely. Geely. You know nothing. Geely. You think Daredevil was bad? No. 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 You have not tasted pain yet. I know there's a scene where Christopher Walken talks about pie. Yeah, we're... Well, speaking of pie... Uh, honest, I will say this. I will say this, most of this movie, and this is surprising to say for a John Woo directed movie, because I mean, this is the same guy who gave us the one-two punch of Saturday morning cartoon great action that were broken arrow and face off. Face off is one of my yeah, favorite action movies. And before that, films like Unboiled, where he popularized the two gun shoot. And like, he took a story that honestly is actually this pretty cool little sci fi heist story. And he turned it into this incredibly boring actioner, where the only saving grace is one scene where a pre thinker for smoking air in that car is chewing out his goon secondhand cold fear. He's like, Why would you stop you? And Colby is probably the best deadpan liar's reach since he goes, I was eating pie. <laughs> Almost like that. <laughs> It's one of those movies where, you know, the basic premise of the story is he, is he agrees to work with um, this big company. And this big company's like, okay, you have to do this work. We don't want you to know what you did. So instead of signing an NDA, we're going to remove your memory of working with this. And he comes back and finds out that they're building this time travel machine, and his future self or went to the payment in exchange to give him all these little knickknacks that'll help him, like, find, like he needs to get out of a building. So he has, and among the knickknacks is a wire that he uses to hack the... Is like, door, and he get, needs to get on a bus, there's a bus token there. That's the idea. This you know, it really sounds like an interesting movie. Again, oh, this I could have watched it if it was good. Again, this could have made a great heist picture. And part of the problem is the fact that, again, this, like my order report, this kind of is a moral 180 with the original message, because in the original story, the time travel is partially amused to an end, because when he, he find out during the two years that the main character was working, there was a, there was a whole military coup and another government in effect. When he gets thrown out, the police pick up because they want to know what he was working on the company, which naturally he has no memory of. And the he suggested in the short story that these memory things have replaced and And basically, his boss tells him, you're welcome to come back anytime. We'd like to work here with you. We'd be glad we're again. But he knows the condition is if he works again, they're just going to wipe his memory again. So he decides he's going to uh, he's going to figure out, once he figure out what's going on, he's going to blackmail the company to allow him to stay on to keep his memories. He wants to try and blackmail himself into a upper level position for better pay. Including marrying the leader's daughter. Because basically he figures the company will protect him once he's in their upper echelons, which isn't an unfair assessment. This, the movie sort of comes up with this like moral about how like time travel will move all Yeah, over. basically. And basically from this one episode of the X-Files called Synchrony. Yeah, it's basically it's the, one of his clues and probably the most asinine how can you find a time to in 
Well, it's basically the entire option is we're helping remember, like we said, he has all these little fluids where he has the right one to not use it. And I'm trying to figure out what this last item is. And he looks on the stamps, and microscopically hit the stamp, is all these headlines about this horrible apocalyptic future that will come about because of this time travel uh, and vision device. And so he has to go and destroy the device because it's the right thing to do. As opposed to, it made him this bad, uh, Aragon of Virtue as opposed to the original thing where it's, screw that, I want to live. Yeah. Uh, I will also say, this movie does contain everyone's favorite things from John Wick. Not an interesting fun action. Doug's the Mexican standoff. Yes. <laughs> Apparently Ben Affleck insisted on the Mexican standoff scene and that's, well, John, they didn't want to do it, but here's like, all Giamatti's in it. Yeah. Oh, and Uma, 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 Uma Thurman. Thurman. Yeah. So it's about also, Batman teaming up with Poison Ivy to stop Two-Face. Excuse me, Batman teaming up with Beatrix and, me, and meanwhile, Marvel has loaned over Laufey and Rhino. So one, one thing this movie did well was their trailer gave away nothing. That's, I will that, say that. That's actually the trailer, actually. actually. But yeah, it's part of the problem. And again, one thing it is, you got Ben Affleck as an otherwise uninteresting lead in the cast surrounded by actors. Ben Affleck work. uninteresting? Well, I never. But again, it's like you look at everyone else in the cast, they're actually pretty interesting. I wouldn't go to Affleck for Yori because even though he doesn't get a lot of great roles, he is still, he's an actor with presence. So Paul Giamatti is in it. Yeah. Any movie that has Paul Giamatti in it and doesn't immediately reconfigure his entire story to be right. about Paul Giamatti <laughs> is a dumb movie. The thing that bugs me about this, this actually bugs me about a lot of like, mainstream Hollywood films in general, is the idea of, you know, corporations doing stuff behind the scenes, corporations going ahead of the government, or essentially truly being the ones that pull the strings, is a very interesting and, you know, right now all too, too real idea. But I feel like in this, and so many of us, they never really explore it well, and I, I also, because I think they're afraid to consider it the money. Awesome. All right. One, of the, one of the really frustrating things in that regard, again, Aaron Eckhart plays a bad guy in this, back before he finally started trying to be a decent actor. And they, they start off the entire idea to make it so he did have a former connection with Ben Affleck's character. But the problem is that connection is flushed out immediately afterwards, so Eckhart can turn to this mustache twirling evil villain who is a, he is always about two steps shy of tying him to the train tracks. <laughs> Make a more interesting movie. And again, this is John Wu. He's not a buff cartoon villain. So that Nicholas Cage can face up, but he's supposed to kind of, you know, direct the actors it's, to make them fun. It's it's really a terrible adaptation, but it's just boring. It Annoy me, irritate me, piss me off. Don't bore me. The very ending with the bird cage. Oh, that was such a cop out. Uh, I should have warned you earlier. We're probably be spoiling most of the movies. Yeah, I don't care oops. about this. Next one? Uh, this next one you will care for as well, but we're going to spoil it anyway. Oh, Richard Linklater, one of the saviors of American cinema. I, whenever I talk about Blade Runner, most people are like, oh, Blade Runner, I've heard of this. No one's heard of this movie. Is this fine. is one of the two best animated movies yes. in the millennium alongside The Secret of Kells. People are always like, oh, what do you mean? Yes, I'm including whatever you think. This is better. This movie is so freaking good. I, really, it's a, it's I, I, I actually would say even beyond investigating, I think it is one of uh, the best films from the 2000 to 2000 era, and it is a shame no one saw it because it is fantastic. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Richard Linklater. Um, you probably know Daisy Pinfuse in School of Rock, but he also did the before uh, Sunrise. Yeah, Slacker before Sunrise, Sunset, Midnight. Uh, he currently has a new film out called Boyhood, which I'm sure you've heard about how he shot it over 12 years. I know we all, you know, you and I are like Coen Brothers or the, you know, heads of Air American Cinema. Link Ladder is someone who he's the neck. He's the neck, and he does. He, the, he takes so many risks in each of his films. Or he tries something. New. He does try something new every time he does something. I, and of all the movies yeah. on this list, I think this one is the most faithful adaptation. Yes, it is. I actually have a soft spot for this movie, partially for that reason, because I'm gonna be honest. I'll be very real kid to pick this out, right? This is still my favorite, and one of the big reasons for it is because. It is a, you can tell it's a very personal read for him. I mean, yeah, he has a lot of stuff to but this was largely This is about his time. It's like, this was largely based off of himself and his friends and their and problems. And the he, he lists on a bunch of people he knew who had suffered some serious problems when he died from drug yeah. use. And actually, he's on that list. One of the things I do like is the fact that Link later does include that epilogue at the end of the movie, because it really is the perfect emotional note to send him. Go ahead, and this, this is another thing that should be noted. Again, this this does have Keanu Reeves in it. It is one of the few films where Keanu Reeves works. It's like, it, it helps that the character he's playing has been, he's kind of burned out his mind on like yeah, the entire point, The entire point of the movie is that he's um, he's a drug addict slash dealer, but he's also a kind of guy yeah. who's trying to bring him. And as the book slash movie progresses, he gets sort of gradually more and more distance from, yeah. his, from himself. Like, uh, the movie can't really capture this, but in the book, when he gets to the parts where he's as the end of a prop, he starts referring to himself 
in the third person. There is definitely also a paranoia theme to it, but a lot of it is just the addict's lifestyle and damage it does. Like there is one, one of the other scenes that really hammers it is there is a scene early on, like, I want to say it was in the first half hour, I could be wrong, where it's, he's flashing back to the life he had before he turned to Substance D, the deadly new future drug. And he's like, he's a father, or he's married, he's got two kids, he's got the happy family life. And then one day he decides he is just, he hits his head and he's like, man, Screw this! Like, I hate this happy I life. Crack. And then it flashes back. It flashes forward to his this horrible rundown house with him. He's kind of like, well, yeah, but at least now I don't know what's coming. He's okay. kind of trying to rationalize the fact that he is now this burnt out yeah. junk. And another thing, I mean, will you notice by this? The, the film is animated, or it's not. It's it's a Yeah, I was going to say it's not animated, but it's it'll, Honestly, it allows it was, for a lot. It was it was filmed. Everything yeah. was filmed. Yeah. Then they actually went back cell by cell, and, and somebody hand did it. Yeah, hand ink in each frame. Honestly, but it's like this allows. I the DVD. Okay, thank. Actually, thank you for adding that. Out of print right now, believe it or not. I want the Criterion Collection to snatch it up. They have a few of these things in here, and I, I know that they would do a beautiful I, I, restoration. I can't really do it justice without showing the motion. Like, you can yeah. sort of see here, it is gorgeously it, 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 There's this one concept that they have called Scramble Suit, where the undercover cops are at, and it shows everyone's faces in the it, world. It constantly flashes by some of these can't ID them. Absolutely Again, gorgeous. The, the, this medium lends itself and I'm, so well, so I cannot imagine this film being made traditionally live action. Yes. It had to be made. It has the thousand live creature coming from Mars. Exactly. That's actually, about three the sins of, of fret for all of them. Two of the best examples of this are these scenes involving Rory Cochran's chicken character Charles Fret, because there was also a scene earlier on where he is kind of having the classic. The idea is Fret kind of is the first example of someone with the drugs that permanently damaged. Drugs are bad. And he actually starts off having the classic insects crawling over the hallucinations. And it's that scene which. If you try to do it in live action, it would either look kind of stupid or overly creepy. It's, instead, you play this sort of darkly comic element built into yeah. rights for it's, it. It's Here, the style you can capture that would be too absurd. It, it is less crazily anti drug than people think. What's the TV tropes turn? Ambulatious? Ambulatious, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I do think some of the best anti drug writing is going to be really, really raw depictions of drugs. Like, my favorite book is Fair and Lonely in Las Vegas. I can't do drugs thanks to that book. And, and to be fair, you can't necessarily entirely call it anti drug considering it is also a pretty scathing shot at rehab centers. There's a lot, yes. there's a lot about it against rehab centers. It turns out the rehab centers are making like, the drug. Especially um, in the original novel, because the film, they kind of downplay it. Too. They kind of downplay it over time, also, but also, the novel. Also, the, the novel picks the new half path rehab center as being almost like a cult that they essentially break you yep. down. It's very, it's, um, they do actually cut a lot of stuff, like I was surprised because I saw the movie first one, they do cut a lot of stuff from inside the rehab center, which I think kind of dulls the impact that you get to the rehab center, it's really freaking I, scary. Again, unfortunately I think it was kind of a casualty of time at that point. Like there's, like there's a part where this guy says like, oh, I'm getting married next week, oh, where are you getting married? Oh, here, I can never leave here, like, what? So yeah, it's kind of horrifying, it really <laughs> is. Uh, I do think we I do think I should probably cut myself off there because I will rant about how great this movie is for the next 20 minutes. Can do a long I time. do want to make one last bit of trivia with regards to the Charles Freck attempted suicide scene here. Yeah. There is a story, apparently the original version, the original plan for this. There is a recording from NPR Backers Live where Philip K. Dick actually read that excerpt from the novel. And they wanted to use that cut for this movie. They really wanted to. The problem is they got the NPR recording, it was so damaged they couldn't. Which is why, unfortunately, they had that house on the but they really wanted to have Dick himself read the scene. His face apparently shows up on the scramble screen one point. I'm gonna have to yeah. go back and find it. So now a movie that I don't love. Uh, uh, anyone who knows Nicholas me love that I do have a I have a thing about Nicholas Cage. It's hard to explain. I think we all, the three of us, do. Of it's like even when he's bad, he's usually but the I one do, bad. But I do. There are a lot of movies he's really good in. Bad Lieutenant. Um, adaptation, 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 adaptation,
Basically, they find a mute that can see half power in the future but has no higher brain function. He's basically he's just instant. It's like he's running on pure primal impulse. And the original idea plan for this movie was to turn him into you know, like a normal dude, and but turn like make it all about how the government's trying to hunt down these mutants. There's a part in the original script where like they suggest they should chop off all his limbs so he can't escape, and they think it's funny. Yeah, the it's very anti-authoritarian. Department of Homeland Security is, is almost cartoonishly evil in the original drafts. And, and then you, then Saturn came in. The movie got options. Saturn came in. And that's the part where I start beating my head against this table. About the best way to describe what this movie turns into is we go from a actually pretty cool story about the fear of what could be the next step that replaces mankind yeah. to a story which is basically two middle fingers aimed at the Department of Homeland Security <laughs> to a story that feels like it was a rejected pilot for an early 2000s show, Fox Run on Friday nights, desperately trying to soak up the extra rage from an X Files episode. It's Ouch. it's a very like the first scene is actually kind of cool because you know oh I can see two minutes in the future so I'm gonna use it for escape casino. Okay, I can roll that. It sort of goes for about an hour. Like, there's this weird little romance subplot that's creepy, and there's this weird little homeland security subplot that's boring. And then it happens, he bangs the girl, and the terrorists capture her, and the movie keeps going, and the end, this nuke goes off, and everyone dies. As in the last hour of the movie is screen. That's the other thing since you brought up the nuke. This is probably the only movies you will ever see where a nuclear weapon is treated as an <coughs> afterthought. Like the movie seems to forget it's an issue for about oh, 90 yeah. percent of the I gotta say, Jessica Biel. Yeah, Jessica Biel is so much more important than the nuke that's gonna go well, on in LA. Wait, even Jessica Homeland Jessica Security. Biel ever been in <laughs> Wait, it wasn't Homeland Security. It was the FBI who forgets about this nuke because they gotta go save Nick Cage's new creepily underage girlfriend. She's like half his age. She exactly. was like fresh out of that weird churchy show she was on. Wasn't she like 25? It's, it's one of those movies where I, I, I was watching it the first like hour and 15 minutes, I was just disappointed. And then it's, it's all just a dream ending, and then I was angry. Here, here's the thing, nine times out of ten, if your ending is, it was all just a dream, you need to put down your pencil, step away from your keyboard right to do, take a step away from your writing premises, and slap yourself. I, I if it doesn't take, do it again and again until you realize why it's a bad way to end. I've come up with a movie theory called Bear Suit Woman, named after another Nicholas Cage classic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is moment, but it, the first moment of Wicker Man, with Rivers Cage, whilst wearing a bear suit, punches a woman in the face. Same and the it is the movie, it is the movie, it is the moment where your movie has gone so horribly wrong, you just need to stop production <laughs> and rewind everything, try to figure out where everything went wrong. You're all, it's all just a dream, is basically a living bear suit. Yeah. It is the moment where your movie's just gone wrong, yeah. stop everything, and restart. Alternately, it is the cinematic version of the, the child saw this in the snow globe ending. And then there, then there are just all those words. The only, the only people that ever knew the child in the snow globe ending right was Story Rock, and that's because they weren't so good. It, it starts, it starts off with a very simple mechanic. You can see two minutes in the future. Except with his girlfriend, you can see like days and weeks in the future. Like, well, how the fuck does that work? <laughs> that's what is wrong. They, they, they never explain it. Love. The, the, the FBI is looking for him because they think he can help. How do these the FBI know about him? We don't care. The terrorists are looking for him because they think he can stop him. How does the terrorists know about him? They don't care. <laughs> Tell me something! So much of this movie is just shockingly put together with no logical connection to strengths. I, I, I honestly think this may have been one of those, like, the Nicolas Cage, well, we all know Nicolas Cage's tax problems, so he will do any movie ever, but I think this is one of those where this was a movie that was probably, this idea was banging around for a while and trying to make it a bunch of times, and then they finally just said, screw it, we don't want to lose any more money, we're going to slap together a movie and release it, and make some wrong, because that does saying, happen. It actually, his hair is atrocious in this movie. Oh, God, I, I, Actually, two things. One, this was, movie, hair this was the movie that gave birth to the My Hair is a Bird meme. Yes. <laughs> and another, besides the really terrible, it was all a dream ending, the third act of this movie is probably one of the worst third acts I've seen in a couple of while because you can see two minutes of the future. This basically turns into, I believe in game terms, this is what's referred to as safe scumming. <laughs> and then basically, he dodges every problem by going ahead and so going ahead and get shot, come back to sniper there, going ahead and get shot, sniper there, over and over, just fighting all the moments by getting himself killed and coming back and guiding them through that way. So it's, there is no tension, no so stakes. So it's like the end of the Scott Pilgrim versus the World movie? More yes. or less. Except for like an it's, hour and a half straight. And it's not being played for laughs here. And I would love it if they could write the rest of it's, uh, and the problem is I do actually really like the short story. I do feel it was a really big influence on the X-Men because it's all about like, oh, mutants are going to replace man. I think they even used the Homo Superior at one point. That's I wonder if we, 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 we actually, we just, we saw they come up in Days of Future Past, both comic and the film versus In the original comic, it's like the title next could still work in the context of the original adaptation of the Golden Man, where it's the concern that 
this guy would be the next step we were about to replace. Instead here it's just, oh no, we call it next because you can see commits in the future, he knows what's happening next. Which again, makes it sound like a bad show, Fox Green, let's try and soak up X Files ratings. Star Angel? Are we, are we tired of writing about this movie? Yeah, let's get to a good movie. Maybe okay. not a perfect adaptation, but still, I think, pretty good one. I just appear. This one's okay. I Best think movie. so. They look like the Blues Brothers. <laughs> yeah, this was a movie before the before Fedoras were associated with MRAs. No, no, it's Trillies. Don't leave Fedoras out of this. Thank you. James, I'm sorry, every time I have a screen cap, I'm hearing it. Well. Nice. Yeah. Like so, um, uh, you might recognize Falcon on the far uh, left, and then one person in is Roger Sterling from Mad Men. Honestly, a lot of what makes this movie work is Emily Blunt, who, if after this and after tomorrow, she is God's gift to be here for Cyber. I mean, oh, yeah. who and would have thought that the, you know, the snotty girl from Devil Wears Prada, even though I loved her in that role, would become like the same, one of the greats, uh, another, the great new sci-fi actors. Another aspect of it that really makes it work is the cinematography from John Toll. Yes. Um, he did Cloud Atlas. I know most of you still haven't seen it. But you should. Just wait till we're done with the panel. Just wait till yeah, we're done with the panel. Then you'll watch Cloud Atlas. <laughs> I, you might not like it. I don't care. But watch it anyway. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's, sorry. it's not a great movie. It's probably going to make a good offbeat date movie in a couple of years. Like, it's... You'll be sitting there thinking, like, oh, I want to watch a date with a movie with my girlfriend. What should I see? Well, Isn't there a movie where Matt Damon Ran away from people in fedoras. Yeah, and oh, yeah. I will say that there are the, the way that hats work is you can actually they, they're kind of like time portals you can jump through stuff. Which is it really in the short story? I, I will say you this know, though. The more I think about this, the more I'm realizing why do I have the feeling this probably inspired the movie Dark City? Like I think this short story may have inspired it. As we were mind. talking about this the other night, I think they're they're in. Uh, who here saw um, Dark City? Okay. The, the if you've read the adjustment team, there's definitely an element of dark, uh, you know, dark city. I think took a lot of elements, especially um, the complete reconstruction of stuff. Um, and the story starts out it's basically a man and wife. They're married. A guy kind of messes up a bit and ends up changing the course of a lot of things. This, you know, basically what this does, and how I mentioned earlier, how sometimes a good adaptation doesn't need to be word for word. Um, it just needs to be true to the idea. And this one, I think, is very true to the idea of, you know, what the adjustment team is, or what the adjustment bureau does, and, you know, the idea of, like, how one thing can kind of change stuff into the future. Um, I will say this, I actually kind of like the look of the adjustment team here. The way they're supposed to look in the story, they're all covered in white. Well, well, most of them, like, um, yeah. but, like, Anthony Mackie's character in the book, he's talking dog. Yeah. Oh, it changes. Yeah, they're, they're, the, the changes for here Change are for the better. Changes is actually, it makes more sense. And it really it does. It, it, it gives a... It, um, it's a fedora pin. No, and, and um, you know, Matt, Matt, Matt Damon and Emily Blunt are very likable in this. Um, of the two, boys from Boston, I've always found Matt Damon to be the more likable one. Um, yeah. Like you said, I think they're going to play Sing Soul Man. Okay. It does, it does look that like that. Um, it is, it is movie based on where the main plot point is love. Um, it actually does kind of make it work, mostly because it's actually like fate and love. I'm, I'm not going to pass it properly. It's not um, love confuses and infuriates. Yes. Yeah, because, um, because that's central to the story and because they actually establish that like, fate is a real thing like, right. in the movie. That and and, and also, I, the one thing I like, and you don't see this in, you know, you definitely don't see this in romantic films, you don't still see it in films all that sometimes, you know, pursuing love might actually mean you two, you don't get to where you want to go. Like, uh, they're one of the reasons they say you shouldn't pursue Emily Blunt's character is he's an aspiring politician, she's an aspiring dancer, and they're like, look, you pursue her, you don't get to where you want to go in your political career, and she ends up teaching dancing to children. Neither of you are going to reach, you know, where you could go. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, that's actually a very <clears throat> relatable, I know, almost so one, fear. I have just one thing to say to that. The infamous Rick and Morty line. Maybe they, they, you have to understand, maybe in a timeline where we hey, each got our goals and never met that true, that came out wrong. Oh, God, yes. That came out wrong. Um, but no, that's, I, I actually like that they they went with that because that's something that's really interesting. The idea that, hey, you know what, sometimes we're assuming your true love is actually not the best thing for you or the other person. It's also, um, and this is very surprising for a very romantic movie. It's also a surprisingly cynical movie. Yes. Especially about human nature. Like, there's one part where he's like, why can't we, Matt like, well, why can't we have free will? And this guy goes, we gave you free will. Yeah. You fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and of course, that's Roger Sterling delivering that line, which if anyone here watches Mad Men, just, uh, you're like, yes, you're right, Roger Sterling. Go pour yourself you, another whiskey. We gave you free will. You gave us the Holocaust. No. <laughs> <laughs> there's also a 
great, and again, going back to the, the way this movie is filmed, again, for a movie that's pretty, I would just say, hey, it's a good rainy day matinee movie, I like it. Um, the, the, the way that it's filmed is great. There's this great scene where Matt Damon has the hat and it, me, it, it the turns hat power. the hat of power. He can sort of put his hand up to a wall and kind of lead him. It's a portal. It can lead him to another in you know, New York. So he's kind of hopping all around. And then one point he gets on the statue, you know, on the Statue of Liberty Island. It's just a very thrilling scene to watch. It's very well shot. It's called the sun. That's true. I have to say one you don't have to deal with homeless people. Stuff. One small side note here with regards to the fact that Despite his, his sort of being a dad, Philip K. Dick himself never seemed to get to do. It wasn't until we were actually discussing this panel that I actually realized this was based on a Philip K. Dick story. So there's kind of more of. What? I, I don't know how much they feel like playing that up. I think the Blade Runner campaign really played up Philip K. Dick's involvement and it flopped, and I think that was the reason they decided to flop. Like, they didn't well, that, the side movies flop all sorts of Well, that's to be fair. Stupid, stupid reasons. Like, to be fair, I think part of it's also considering how wildly several movies deviate. It's basically inviting. Look how much we jumped yeah, off the page. Yeah, you almost don't want to credit it because yeah, people yeah. who read the books will go, "You took like one idea and then just went." Hollywood decided that Mars needs bombs, goes to Mars, and was the mission to Mars? John oh, yeah. Carter. John Carter. John Carter. So John Carter took the pipe. Which is a uh, yeah. John Carter's on the movie. Hey. No, 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 no. I will honestly say that movie is not that bad. It was just ruined by terrible. There was also it's also the same in uh, the the blockbuster movies too. They the Hollywood trying to recreate. They picked the wrong parts. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's well, as we as we were and you can see a good segue for Total Remake. Oh, I see it on your notes, sir. James, <laughs> James you, 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 signed, uh, you signed that contract, didn't you? I told you that place is bad to work for. <laughs> I can't remember. Well, I, I guess we're going to, but um, as uh, you so were saying. So refund. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. This, yeah. this happened. The only thing that was that was I run a bunch of people about to see this instead of Seven Cycle. Oh, God damn it. Yeah. Now, it also had that atrocious line, what can I say, I give good wife. Whoever thought that line was good should <laughs> stab them. That guy, that woman is married to the director. What the hell is going on in that marriage? This is what, He likes her in tight leather, I can tell you that. This is, this is one of those movies where I really, and it's like, in the theater, I think we were actually there in the theater because I think we were, we, were, I, we okay. never saw this movie. No, not the theater, we saw the trailer, I think I just started going, no. This movie no, is, no, movie is no. devastatingly boring. And then there's points where it's like, like, there's there's two main areas in this one. There's Australia and there's Britain. Australia is a rainy cyberpunk city with people wearing around like, Clear, clear plastic umbrellas. Clear, <laughs> the best clear, thing clear. I was like, oh, fucking hell. And then they get to, Written and they're doing action scenes on cars on rails. Are you kidding me with this shit? Okay, it's also the point where you need to say the studios were lying, lying, horrible Again, people on this. They said, you know, oh, we're not going to just read, we're not going to remake the Arnold movie. You know, we're going to, you know, be closer to the story. No, you're not. They have these really weird moments. They call back to the Arnold movie, like the chick with the three tits shows up. Yeah. But since there are no mutants in this movie, she has, she's just there. Like, what are you doing it here? No and going to get surgery? Is that like a mutation? Want to explain? No, you're leaving. They probably just felt they were being cutesy with a fun Easter egg. Yeah, honestly, and just, just it reminds me a lot of the 2000, the um, other, the 2011 remake of the thing, where they keep going, oh no, this is going to be completely different. It's going to. And, it's essentially the same thing in a slightly different it's setting. It's a beat for beat retread of the original. It's where they add a couple of chicks because some producers had sausage fest on a meeting. And yeah, then they, they, they kind which of. Which makes no sense considering that, that they actually used to work for my parents, to, like my aunt still works for the government. Those sites actually made you like to keep gender segregated. Well, that they also. Bang. They wrote in a couple yeah. Norwegians to justify it. Look, it's a prequel! It's not. It's not a prequel. Why doesn't the Norwegian the being in the movie speak English? Because they don't speak Norwegian, and John Carpenter's the thing. So, yeah, we can Anyway, we're, we're getting on top. We're getting on top. There's not much to talk about with this movie. It's <laughs> this movie just, is so remember, boring, we're talking about other movies. Right? Like, remember, exactly. Arnold, remember Arnold's movie? It's that, the kind of stupid. Arnold's movie Arnold. at least had the weird, like, when they're exposed to the, uh, the atmosphere of <laughs> Mars, like, the weird bugging out faces and the lady with her face boring, coming apart. It us. also led to probably one of my favorite horrible side characters in a Paul Verhoeven movie. I got five kids to be. <laughs> I got five kids to be. Paul Verhoeven also Ooh. directed one of the greatest films of all time, Showgirls. I just want to throw that out there. Liz, I'm sorry. Robocop still takes precedence. For two Says you. Everyone got eats and shit. Two words, Liz. Clarence Bodiger. I do feel this movie probably got green lips. People like, hey, people like that movie Minority Report, right? Mm -hmm. We should make that. So I'm going to uh, so I think we're actually done. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we don't want to talk about this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
the filthy did the artist uh, paint and what you wrote for his drug use? That's, uh, I feel very, um, again, I'm, I'm putting my librarian hat on. I feel very irresponsible answering that uh, because that is speculation. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. I think it, like, there's definitely some things, like, some things in there where you do kind of wonder. It's like when you read a lot of other authors where then you find out they were on drugs and you kind of go, oof, well, that explains some of it. But he also seemed to be someone who, who you know, he was very paranoid, but he also, I think, was ahead of his time in a lot of things, uh, you know, uh, pre crime, uh, yeah. you know, the way corporate, you know, a corporation prominence in society. I mean, some of those other stories I've heard is only do have some kind of drug team to them. Like, one of the ones which I, I'm torn on whether I want to actually get the or not because it could be interesting, but they could also completely ruin it. He has a novel called Wait and Now Wait for Last Year. And one of these, if, besides the fact there's a, already a plot where this basically the guy's playing physician to a president who is essentially playing possum to ward off alien invaders. Like, he literally pretends to be sick and dying constantly. But the the title of the fact that there is a illegal drug in the book that you take it and it basically sends your body back in time. You go back for a limited duration, then you can come back to the present either with information or things you snack. This was the working on adaptation of King of the Elves. I remember that. Um, Disney's working on it. Oh, 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 like, oh, oh, oh crap! A quick question: um, Was the movie um, AI artificial intelligence based on it? Okay, no, that was, a, that was Brian Aldiss. I don't know if it was based off directly, but I do think it took a lot of themes from it. I think yeah. the Kubrick version were taking more themes. But it, yeah, was, I mean, it was based on a short story by Brian Aldiss called Super Toys Last All Summer Long. Yeah, and but were they, um, were they, weren't they publishing around the same time? Like, I think they were, actually. Yeah, like, who's, I mean, if we're, I, I think you, meant, you did mention, yes. For someone who hasn't had any adaptations, is his work, his influence is seen popping popular. up all over. I've actually seen on Battlestar, seen on Terminator. Yeah. Actually, we see we see pre coming. There is one. There is one novel they've been trying for years to adapt. It's gone through a couple different people, and I think it's finally died again. Was they've been trying to adapt the novel with Ubik for a while now. Like there is actually someone actually did a complete script draft, which I think they were selling at one point. Um, any other questions? Oh, sure. Can you do the man podcast? They've been talking about trying to make it happen, but. It's a tough sell because it is such a meta story. The problem yeah. with, a lot of, with adapting a lot of complicated stories is they require a big budget because of their play, their like play setting and action, but they're also really, really weird. Yeah. Like, Do you think that maybe an animated, like an animated feature, maybe a traditional 2D animated, could cut the budget? It bit? might be able to, but that's the thing. Like people, so you see this with like the standard art, with kind of not making a lot of money. Yeah. People associate, especially in America, associate animated movies with kids. There is nothing in anything Philip K. Dick did that is for kids. No, um, I have to admit though. Maybe if another country type, like you know, other I do say like there are other countries making animated films, like Japan to crack at it, like France, France made Persepolis. Uh, it's really I, it's like much here. Yeah. personally, I'd be very interested to see it done, especially if you get a director who would handle the entire idea of the alternate history where the Axis won yeah. correctly, because right. that. With some directors that be like giving them a loaded gun and saying go nuts. I also think I, I think in some cases like mini a mini series might also be a better. Uh, I, I think mini series are a lot of denser works. Yeah. This time. Like since we can actually get good ones, I think that's all yeah. the more viable option. And since and, and now since I mean. True. Uh, and since television is actually becoming a lot more like, let's take, you know, especially cable, saying, okay, let's take some risks on this, because film studios are becoming a lot more risk averse. Television, yeah, well, television is, is now well, starting to be a place where you can experiment. That means globalization in film means they have to make it as palatable as uh, wide an audience as Sorry for swearing. Anyone else? 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 Oh, uh, oh, I think actually check out Black Mirror. I've heard good things. Uh, yeah, I've not, I've not start, with, start with any episode of the first one. Okay, right. I'll take a look into that. Or we will, sorry. Uh, I'll be getting into the uh, realm of speculation again, but during Philip K. Dick's lifetime, do we know what he felt of the adaptations of the stories? Uh, the only one that was made in his lifetime was Blade Runner. And, and that one, he, he, like, he, he liked the up. script. He said it was a companion piece to his work, rather than yeah. a straight mm -hmm. adaptation, which I think is actually very accurate. Um, I, I think something like Next or Paycheck would probably be. I, I think any director would probably want to kill themselves if someone was like Next or Paycheck. Basically. I get the feeling in those cases, I just see Dick walking out of the theater with both middle fingers raised. <laughs> Philip K. Dick would be walking out and just Dick taking a train, like, little, nope. Had very little time for anyone to bullshit. Actually, there was one other story I'm kind of surprised they haven't tapped yet, and again, I'm not sure if I want to see them make this or not. 
There was an album we did called Four White Tears of Policemen today where it's, yeah, this guy, yeah, it's, it could be interesting where it's this guy where he suddenly finds out his entire life's been changed when he's asleep. And in the right hands, like, there's not a Twilight Zone episode. It's like, in the right hands, it's got an absurd you can make for an interesting movie. Keywords in the right hands. I mean, the Coen brothers were talking about doing sci fi, they were talking about doing, um, the Yiddish policemen. Yeah, oh my god, the Michael Chabon novel. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, I'd like yes. to see, I'd like, I'd like, the main point is that if I want to see anything of his adapted, I want to see it done right. Mm -hmm. A lot of directors, especially if they're working with the kind of budgets they make for these movies, they're going to be cowards. And take, they're going to take the easy way out and get the happy ending or the easy stories. That's not really what his work is about. You see, and when you screw this stuff up, you know, we all remember what happened when David Lynch did do. <laughs> and David Lynch is no coward. You know what the scary part is? Apparently, Frank Herbert actually approved of that movie. I think he was actually nearing the end of his life at that point, so that might have something to do with it. Uh, there's right. another question. Uh, well, any, we have time for one, one more. more. Uh, Rico, the second movie. Isn't it a bad movie? But I like the lady that played that guy's wife. She was good. Okay, back in sale, yeah, but she still had that. I know it wasn't her fault, but that I give good wife line. I'm just like, even in the trailer, I'm like, I am not she's, having this. She's married to the director, which makes the whole, like, yeah. like the environment with the main yeah. villain in the movie. And the she's a, she she's been to her own. Right. Yeah, she's, she's, she's charismatic and she actually, I think, makes for a good villain. And what's really weird now that I think about it, it's really weird they have these like Power Rangers robots and she's so much harder to kill than they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I think she's actually going to be a part of the other woman racing. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for watching the character in. Uh,